Our text this morning is Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. But Father, apart from the work of your spirit in our hearts, your word itself will remain dark to us. And so we ask that you would pour your spirit into our hearts that we might be filled with your heavenly light. As the psalmist prayed, in your light we see light. So may your spirit light the way that we might actually see the light of your word. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and amen. amen. Um, this morning we're beginning a, a new series uh, that I'll be preaching through on the subject of eschatology. But I, I should give you a very important footnote here that when I say the word eschatology, I actually mean that term in its more classical sense and not in its sort of popular theological uh, sense. Uh, so uh, the word eschatology is derived from the Greek adjective eschatos, which just means last. It's the last thing, the final thing. So when you study eschatology, what you're supposed to be doing is looking at the end and how things all end. Um, eschatology is supposed to be the study of the last things, which is the title of this series, the last things. Um, but in contemporary Christianity, um, eschatology has I think because primarily because of premillennial dispensationalism, which is, I think, uh, either misread a number of passages or maybe just kind of invented a number of passages, it's created this very fanciful um, uh, narrative about what precedes uh, what we normally think of as eschatology, uh, the tribulation, the rapture, and a whole bunch of other things like that, that I think are... Um, it's a mistaken way of reading the text, but it creates this very sort of sensationalized story that, that people are very fixated on. And so you've got, uh, you know, fiction, uh, you know, imagining life in that world and whatnot. Um, I think that's a bit of a distraction. And I, what I want to do is I want to focus more on classical eschatology, which is... Um, the, the things that happen at the end, and that goes from uh, the second coming of Christ, the resurrection, the final judgment, and heaven and hell. Okay, so that's what I'm going to be focusing on through this series, and I think it's a, um, because of the, um, how the sensationalized version of eschatology tends to get all the attention, this is a bit of an under, it's, um, it's an underappreciated and understudied subject, but it's one that I think we ought to uh, understand well as Christians. Um, the end of creation uh, we um, is the, the end of creation, the, the beginning of um, eschatology, the eschaton, is inaugurated by the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now this plays into a lot of the popular level um, eschatology, and so there's a little bit of overlap between today's sermon and, and what's commonly thought of as eschatology, but it'll be less so as we proceed on through the series. The end of creation is inaugurated by the second coming of Jesus Christ. The angels explained to the disciples that just as the, um, the risen, the resurrected Christ, who had appeared to them after three days in the grave, was resurrected, and then he, uh, the resurrected Christ, ascends into heaven bodily, physically. Uh, the, the body that he was resurrected with, he stands in front of them, and he ascends into heaven before their very eyes. And the angels tell the disciples, who are standing there still looking up, amazed by what they had just seen, he's, the angels tell the disciples, what are you doing standing around? He will come again, and we're told that when, when he comes again, he's going to return in like manner. He will turn in like manner. As he, as he ascended into heaven um, bodily, so he is going to return again in like manner. He comes back from heaven in a bodily, um, in, a, in a physical body. Um, Paul describes Christ's second coming in 1 Thessalonians like this. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18. And it's probably a fairly important text for, uh, for understanding the second coming. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means proceed those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, <coughs> with the voice of an archangel, 
and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So let's define what we mean by second coming. Um, The second coming of Jesus Christ refers to a future physical return of the resurrected Jesus Christ coming from heaven to this earth to gather his resurrected saints from all of human history, to gather them together with him, to be with him for all eternity. You should notice that um, despite the fact that I think it's something we don't um, we don't have a very good understanding of, we don't spend enough time on, it's interesting because this is something that we confess weekly. This is actually like a fundamental article of our faith, and we confess it weekly. When we recite the Apostles' Creed, we recite this. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence, he will come to judge the living and the dead. From there, from heaven, he, the resurrected Jesus Christ, will come. He's going to, he's going to come. That, that's in our weekly confession that we recite in the Apostles' Creed. And I would say we also, um, we also express the, our, our, our faith in this and confess this weekly when we come to the Lord's Supper. Remember when Paul uh, gives us uh, his instruction for celebrating the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. This is from the text that we read every single week when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Until he comes. We, we, are, we are, when we gather together to take the Lord's Supper, we're professing that our faith in him as we wait for him to return. Okay, so again, uh, we confess in the Apostles' Creed and we confess it in the Lord's Supper. Let's unpack this a little bit further. Um, what, what is the, the second coming? How does this work? What, we ought, what ought we to believe about it? First, I think it's important to realize that the second coming is an actual moment that is in all of our futures. It's an actual moment that happens in in every single individual here. It is in your future. It's a historical moment that is going to happen. Um, Whether you are alive when Jesus returns or whether you are in the grave, when he returns, you will come from the grave and you will meet him. Okay, you will experience this moment no matter who you are or where you are. You're going to experience this. And you're going to experience it if you're in the Christ or outside of Christ. Both of them will, both, all people are going to see this. Um, I think, and I, and I say, I, I want to emphasize that this is something that actually happens. Because I think that um, as a Christian, despite, um, despite holding to this belief, it's easy to hold something and not expect it. Like to believe something without actually counting on it or having it work in the equations in your head. It's easy for this to be a point of theology that you hold to, but it's something entirely different to have this be a future event that you are actually anticipating. And if you search inside your heart for a bit, uh, why is it hard to anticipate? It's probably because, well, nothing like this has ever happened to you before. Okay? Nothing like this has happened to you before, and so it's hard to anticipate it. But the fact that something hasn't happened before is not an argument against why you can't count on it in the future. Um, you have moments of this in your life. You know, as, as you live a few years, you start to experience this again and again. I, I think the first time I can remember really experiencing something like this was when um, I, I graduated from high school. Because it's strange, you know, it's just a few years that you're in high school, but at that age... Um, it felt like my time in high school was was eternal. Um, it, it felt like the you know the walls of this building and this institution and my commitments here. This is just my life. It's my world, and it seemed as if it would continue on forever. It seems like I had always been here, and I always will be here. And then one day, out of nowhere, you walk across the stage, and they give you a diploma. And I I never once set foot in that building again. In May of 1990, I walked out, and I've never gone into that room, into that building again. But at the time that I was there, it felt like it would never end. Um, I didn't think the end would come. And and uh, and you can think of this in, in a lot of ways, different things in your life. Um, if you you know think about waiting or anticipating marriage. It it feels like it will never actually happen. And then all of a sudden you're married and you have a family and this is your world. Or I think the the ladies go through this and the men sort of alongside them with with pregnancy. It it feels as this 
this is just going to go on forever. It will never end. I'll always be this size, I'll always have this thing out in front of me. Um, it, it can feel forever, and then all of a sudden it happens. We, as, as such finite little humans, have a difficulty anticipating the, 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 um, the future that is before us and how big that future is. And it's the same way with the second coming of Christ. You don't feel like it could happen because it hasn't happened. But how is that an argument against it happening? You have to understand in Scripture that this is something that we are promised and we ought to be expecting and, and, and preparing for in our hearts. Okay, um, the, God has declared a time when this life will end, um, well, it will all end, or rather be transformed into something totally different. And that transition is announced by the physical return of Jesus. And I'm stressing that word um, physical, that attribute of him uh, here, because I think that's something, there's something that's really important here, that we're saying Jesus Christ himself, the one who is resurrected in that body, in his resur resurrected body, returns physically. Um, I want to emphasize that physicality because there's, there's a trajectory to your faith that you should be thinking about and seeing. There's a trajectory here. What I mean by that is when you were saved, when you became a Christian, you were saved because you heard a promise. You heard a promise, the preached gospel or you read the gospel. You heard the promise and you received it by faith. You believed it. Um, you said, okay, I haven't seen Jesus Christ himself. I didn't witness uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of him, but I've heard this message and I believe it. And so there's this promise that I receive by faith, okay? Um, and your whole life, your whole life as a Christian has been a matter of walking by that kind of faith, right? Paul tells us we walk by faith, not by sight. We haven't seen these things happen. We believe that they happen. Okay, we walk by faith, not by sight. We don't see, we hear, and we believe. That's your current existence. But a time is coming when what we have believed will become what we actually see. Where we will actually see these things. It will be revealed before us. And this is a trajectory for your faith. You're growing up. There's a, there's a, there's a transition that is happening here. 1 John tells us in, in 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, 2. Okay? Well, there's a time coming when he's going to be revealed, and we will see him. We will actually see who he is. We will see what he looks like. And faith will be replaced by sight, or faith will be fulfilled in sight. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 12 and 13. Uh, for now we see in a mirror dimly. Um, you, you squint to, to get what it's quite uh, like. But then face to face. Okay, now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. How will you see face to face? Because he will have a face. He will have a literal face in front of you and you will see him face to face. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part because I'm seeing through this, this dim mirror. But then I shall know, just as I also am known. I will see him. I will know him. Now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. There is a time coming when you see the resurrected Jesus Christ, when faith and hope, which were tools that were necessary to bridge the gap between where you are now and where he is, faith and hope will fall away. And then the resurrected Christ is in front of you, and all that is left is love. Our faith and hope get you there, but when you're there, they're unnecessary because he's in front of you, okay? And, you, and it all culminates in love itself. Currently, we operate by faith in a promise, but the appearance of Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that promise. Faith and hope are how we respond to that promise from a distance, seeing dimly in the mirror. But when you are face to face with him, faith and hope will fall away, and then you'll be left but what you'll be left with is love. Jesus will return in the flesh and seeing him face to face will be the culmination of your salvation. Uh, in this life, we are always, we're always striving to have our eyes on Christ, right? Um, uh, Hebrews 12, 2, we're told that we're supposed to be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And that idea of looking at Jesus, looking towards Jesus, dominates our, um, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> our, our, our devotional understanding of what our heart is supposed to be like. We're always saying stuff like, I need to get my eyes on Jesus. Put your eyes on Christ. Uh, we just sang, be thou my vision. 
Be thou my vision. Be the thing that I'm looking at. And we exhort ourselves and we exhort one another all the time with, look to Jesus, look to Jesus, get your eyes um, on him. But you should notice that in all of that, we are, um, we are describing a, a metaphorical looking, right? When I say look to Jesus, I don't think that any of you actually see him, right? You, you're, it's a metaphorical looking that you're doing now. And scripture exhorts us to, uh, to that, but it's, it's a metaphorical putting your eyes on him, setting your mind on Christ. Um, but it turns out that the reason why we are, we are metaphorically looking for him is because someday we are actually going to see him. All right? The metaphor resolves into an actual physical reality. And this is the true beatific vision that we're aiming for. The beatific vision is, the, in, in the medieval era, this was this idea, the blessed vision, the, um, the, the ability to actually look and see Jesus himself. And it was like the culmination of your devotional life was to get to the beatific vision where you see him. And it turns out the reason why that so dominates the devotional life is because that's how this all concludes. We see Jesus himself. Now, for the unbeliever, the appearance of Jesus will be a moment of terrible judgment. All of us will see him, the unbeliever and the believer alike, we'll all see him. The unbeliever will experience that moment as a moment of terrible judgment. 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, 1 through 3, we're told this, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Okay, there, there's this thief in the night that comes. Now, <clears throat> I think this verse is misused frequently because it's often used to describe this secret rapture, which is what the Christians are supposed to experience in the premillennial dispensational eschatology. But it's quite clear from this text that what Paul is describing is not the secret rapture that the Christians experience, but actually the, the non-Christians' sudden encounter with the second coming of the risen Jesus. Um, and you know this because he continues on. He says this, but the appearance, he says, um, uh, this is verses four and five, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Okay, so he says there's, there's, a, there's this experience where when Jesus comes, it will be black, it will be dark, and he'll come in the dark like a thief in the night, and it'll be terrorizing. That darkness is not the, the darkness of, uh, of surprise or something like that. It's the darkness of sin. It's the darkness of evil. It's somebody who is living in a life dominated by evil, and they, they can't conceive of the coming of Christ, and therefore when he comes, it's a total shock and a terror. That's if you're outside of Christ. The second coming of Christ is the thief in the night. But then Paul says, but you are not in darkness. You aren't, you aren't living in that life of sin. You're not enslaved to sin. You're living in light. The, the, coming, the second coming of Christ is something that you're eagerly looking forward to. You're waiting for it. You see it coming. You're not surprised by it. You're expecting it. Uh, it's not supposed to be that thief in the, thief in the night language for you. It's, it is real. I think it's really unfortunate because that, that popular eschatology has taken the doctrine of the second coming of Jesus and turned it into like a boogeyman or a ghost, score, a ghost story to scare people and get people sort of sensationalized about the terror of this whole thing. And that's just um, 180 degrees opposite the way this doctrine is supposed to be preached to us. It's supposed to be this great comfort and this wonderful thing. Unbelievers are in the dark and the appearance, of, the appearance of Jesus is like an unexpected thief showing up in the middle of the night. But believers are not in darkness. You're in daytime and you're in sunshine and the appearance of Jesus is the culmination of everything that you've been yearning for. It is your faith turning to sight. It is the, it is the, <coughs> it is the sunrise that you've been straining your eyes looking at the horizon waiting for. If you've ever been up in the early mornings, you know, if you go backpacking or something and you're freezing, waiting for the sun to come up and you're just, your eyes are looking at the horizon, straining, oh, please, the sun come up, warm us up. And then finally that first sort of finger of a ray of sunlight comes up on the horizon and the sun is here. All right, that is the second coming. It's light, it's bright, it's brilliant, and it's wonderful. It's something we should be looking forward to. Um, 
Side note here. If Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven with a physical body, and he's going to return from heaven to earth in that physical body, does that mean that if his physical body can go to heaven and can come back, does that mean that heaven is a physical place that he can inhabit? Um, does that mean that, to put it in a, on a very crass sort of way, is heaven a place that Elon Musk could take you to in a rocket ship? Right? Is it because if, if he's got a physical body, can he can come here and he can go back? Then is is heaven this <coughs> this physical place that's accessible by our space travel? I'm sorry if this is like a little too esoteric of a rabbit trail, but I can't help but have these kinds of speculations. And so, um, so so uh, humor me for just a moment as I kind of run down this a little bit. Um, Yes, we believe that Jesus' resurrected body is a true physical body, and it is located somewhere. And the somewhere is a, is a where, is a real place. In his divinity, the Son is omnipresent. All right? Remember that Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ is, both, is the Son of God incarnate, the Son of God made man, which means he has a true human nature and a true divine nature. Okay? In his divinity, in his divine nature, he's omnipresent. He's omnipresent. But in his humanity, he has a true human nature, which means it is physically located somewhere. His, his, his physical body um, is not a, a magical body that's spread throughout the universe. His physical body is a real, true physical body like ours. It's resurrected, which means in that sense it's not like ours. Uh, but it's still um, a finite physical body located somewhere. Um, <clears throat> this is one of the reasons, This is now I'm really going down another rabbit trail, this is one of the reasons why uh, in the Reformed Church we reject mystical doctrines of the presence of Jesus' body in the, in the Lord's Supper. Okay, mystical doctrines of the presence of Jesus' body in the Lord's Supper. We don't, um, Jesus' body is resurrected and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. We don't believe that his body physically shows up in the Lord's Supper because it's located somewhere. It's a real body. It's a resurrected body, and it's located somewhere, and that somewhere is not here right now. You can't take his physical body and make it omnipresent, okay? Because it's a real, true physical body, not a magic body. Um, his body is in heaven and not magically conjured here on Sunday mornings. This was in the Reformation, uh, one, one point of Christology that became a point of tension, both with the Catholic Church, but also with the Lutheran Church. Um, you'll, you'll notice that when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, you know how the minister always holds the loaf of bread up and then breaks it? Okay, he breaks it. That tradition, it's, it's, um, we're imitating the pattern that we see in, uh, in 1 Corinthians and the description of the, the giving of the Lord's Supper. So we're imitating that pattern. But it's also, it became a, a thing during the Reformation that the minister would break the body because in the Catholic and in the Lutheran churches, they, did, they thought that something magical had happened to the body where, where, the, where the physical body of Jesus was in the bread. And to break it was to disrespect the physical body of Jesus. And so there was this kind of um, protection around the loaf, but the Reform said, no, no, that that's not what's going on here, and they would break it. It was called the fractio panis, the breaking of the bread. And it became a, a liturgical element in all Reformed churches to, to emphasize our understanding of who Jesus is, where he is, and, and what he's done. Um, anyhow, so that's that, that another little rabbit trail. But all of this to come back to, Jesus has a physical body that's located somewhere, but I would say it does not follow from this that that somewhere can be accessed by Elon Musk's uh, spaceship. Um, I think it's likely that there is a, a dimensional barrier where, where we, between where we are and the throne room, that God can, in heaven, which is a real place, but I think his world is beyond our um, understanding, at least our present understanding, and I think it's possible for his world to be immediately present here. I think he could rip open the sky and his, his throne room is right before us. I don't think we can get there uh, with a spaceship. In other words, okay, so that whole rabbit trail having been run down, I want to come back to this question of the, the, the second coming of Jesus and what we believe the second coming of Jesus is. One thing that makes teaching on the second coming very difficult is that there are a number of other passages um, that describe Jesus coming, 
but which don't describe this final coming at the end of all things, but rather they describe moments of judgment, primarily moments of judgment in the first century and usually culminating around 70 AD when, when uh, Jerusalem was destroyed. So you have God working with his old covenant people and, and Jesus coming at, um, you know, at the beginning of the first century, crucified around 33 AD. Um, but then God is, uh, is shutting down that old covenant system. He's shutting down the temple, the sacrificial system. And it's ultimately done in 70 AD when the temple is destroyed, never to be rebuilt. That's when uh, you see the culmination of this transition from the old covenant into the, the new covenant. That's the, the final culmination of it. Uh, when, the, when the temple and the sacrifice is removed. And that moment is a moment of incredible judgment. It's a very profound moment of judgment. And it's described, that judgment is described as a coming of Jesus against Jerusalem. He comes in the sky against them. And you have other passages that describe um, different times when Jesus comes. But it's not the second coming where he uh, returns uh, to earth to gather us together. There are moments when he comes to judge his people and this is not, this shouldn't surprise us. If you look in the Old Testament, you have promises of the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah is going to come. But then you also have temporal judgments throughout the Old Testament where God comes. And he comes and he judges nations. But the fact that he comes in those moments does not, um, does not take away from or, or, um, or invalidate the fact that there is going to be a definitive coming in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, that first coming. And so the same way, since we have this second coming that's, that, that is on the horizon, there are comings that come before that, 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 that precede it, but don't take away from it. They don't, um, the fact that we say, well, he came in 70 AD, so how do we know that he's going to come now? Maybe this was all the same event. No, I don't think so. I, I think that you can distinguish between these temporal comings and judgments and this final true second coming. In, um, in Matthew 24, I think you see a good example of something like this. Jesus clearly predicts the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD when you're looking at Matthew 24, especially when you're looking at the beginning of it. But he transitions to talk about the second coming of Christ and the final judgment. I think the bulk of the book of Revelation also describes events in, that happened in the first century. All right, these, are, these are events that happened in the first century. So how do you, how do you make sense of this? How do, you, um, how do you make sense of this? Because sometimes these passages are like right up against each other. Matthew 24 is talking about, largely about the destruction of Jerusalem, but by the time you get to Matthew 25, you're hearing about final judgment. And they're, and they're right next to each other. So how do you, how do you um, puzzle this out? How do you get this all sorted? A couple of things here. Let, let me just give you a, a couple of pieces of, of a little, little things that might help a little bit. At, at the same time, I am going to give the disclaimer that this isn't a, a, um, the popular eschatology sermon. So a lot of this you would need to dive into a, another subject. But it's still so that we can preserve the integrity of the second coming. It's worth talking about this just for a second. The first thing to notice is that the, the, um, the term second coming is not a biblical term. Second coming is not a biblical term. Um, and, and, and second makes it sound like there's just going to be two and anything in between violates the, the revelation of God. No, second coming is a theological term that we've come up to describe Jesus' um, definitive return at what we now call as the second coming. But there's no, no, there's no number system put in Scripture such that if there is a, a, a form of coming between the first and the second coming, it now violates the, the terminology that we have called this um, the second coming. So that's, um, it might not be, to call it the second coming might not be the best term. It's really the, Jesus' final coming, but <clears throat> it's so... Uh, commonly, that's just how we refer to it. That's kind of the term that we're stuck with. Um, uh, second thing, I think, it, as I said earlier, it, it, it might seem at first to be weird to have passages that seem to conflate temporal judgments in the first century with the final judgment at the end of human history. As I mentioned, Matthew 24 does this. You start like, okay, this is destruction of Jerusalem. It's pretty clear. There's some very clear timestamp language in it that it's talking about something that culminates in 70 AD. But then all of a sudden, we're talking about things that are final judgment. And then you start wondering, are these the same thing? Is it okay to distinguish between the two? And you get the same thing, I think, in 2 Thessalonians, stuff that sounds like Okay, this is something that happened in the first century. No, wait a minute. This is sound like something that sounds like the end of, of human history. Maybe they're all the same thing. I, I think that um, 
And, and, and I get how it does seem weird that these are just right up against each other. And are you, being, um, are you being just a little bit disingenuous with the text to try to say, oh, no, no, there's thousands of years between these, possibly 10,000 years uh, be- between these events. Is that a little bit disingenuous? Are we forcing something onto the text? But I think if you were to think about this for a moment, you would see how actually so how common it is to do exactly what I'm describing here and that we do it all the time. So for example, if I said to you, um, let's, say I'm, let's say I'm preaching the gospel to someone. Uh, somebody is living in high sinful rebellion against God. They're, um, they're, they're deep in their sin and I want to tell them about like, you need to understand the significance of the life you're living. And I say, listen, you might walk out of this sermon, go across the street in the crosswalk and bam, the UPS truck hits you and you are gone, all right? You could walk out right now, the UPS truck could hit you, and you're going to be standing before the throne of God, and you're going to have to answer for your sins. And you want to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ at that moment. And, and I'm, I'm explaining to him the significance of the gospel and the necessary um, to, to, uh, to have Christ's imputed righteousness. That's what I'm trying to make um, clear to him. But notice that in that right there, and that's, and that's a... That's a um, That would be a sermon kind of narrative that would be extremely common for us to use. But notice right there how I have just conflated two things that, while logically are immediately subsequent, are temporally far apart. I, 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 it sounds like I just implied that there's that in in history there's the UPS truck and then there's the judgment of God, right? The, The final final judgment in the throne room of God when. No, I, I think that there's, like, again, probably 10,000 years between those two events. But I've put them right next to each other because logically, I want to tell you how you could, you could hit judgment in this life and then you're going to be standing before God and you're going to face that final judgment. And, and it, logically, those things next, need to be next to each other. And so you can imagine Jesus speaking to an audience in Jerusalem and he's telling them, listen, you don't understand the Romans are going to come and if you will not, if you will not bow the knee, if you will not turn your, uh, from your sin, if you will not soften your hard heart and receive the gospel, if you will not receive that, you're going to be standing here in Jerusalem <coughs> and you're going to be slaughtered by the Romans. All right? That is the coming of Jesus. You're going, to, you're going to experience that judgment and the consequence of that is you're going to be standing before God in the final judgment. And these are logically connected but they might be temporally far apart. So I don't think it's weird that a lot of times, uh, Matthew 24 or 25, 2 Thessalonians, a lot of times you see these things together where temporal judgment and eternal judgment are put right next to each other. That's because it makes sense to talk about it that way. At the same time, you do have to, if you want to, fig- if you want to sort out the timeline, there's a lot of difficult work you have to do to kind of detangle and explain it all. And it's clear when you're, when you're reading these texts that the audience that received the New Testament also had to have their hands held as they walked through this. It was very difficult. Paul's writing in, in 2 Thessalonians <clears throat> in the middle of this very complicated question. He writes and he says this. This is 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 5. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? He's, he's trying to explain the difference. He says, listen, I sat and I unpacked it all, and you still are struggling to kind of figure out what goes where. And you see that a couple of times in his writing when he's dr- addressing eschatology, where he references long conversations that he had with them. And it's clear that we don't have all of his teaching on this, and, and, and that even those that received it all are still struggling to kind of separate out. So it's a bit tricky, and I think it's okay if we're a lot of times a bit puzzled on exactly where the lines are. But the thing that we need to notice is that um, we do have a future second coming. And at um, at the second coming... Jesus doesn't just come in temporal judgment. It's, this is not just a, um, I'm addressing the, the hard-heartedness of, of Israel or this nation or, or this people. Um, when Jesus comes at the second coming, he comes as a triumphant king, having completed his conquest of the entire earth by the power of his gospel. And his arrival sounds like the coming of a king. There's a sound to the second coming of Jesus. Um, he comes to the sound of a trumpet blast. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 52. Behold, I tell you all a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The trumpet will sound, 
And then there it is, all right? Then the trumpet comes with the second coming of Jesus. You go down to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. <clears throat> there, is a, there is a global blast of the trumpet, and Jesus Christ himself physically returns to this earth. And the trumpet announces the completion of the mission that Jesus was, was set on, which is the evangelization of the whole world. 1 Corinthians 15, we're told this. He's, Paul says, then comes the end, okay? The eschatos, the, 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 final, the final everything. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God, uh, the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all, thing, all enemies under his feet. He must reign till he puts all of his enemies under his feet. So Jesus, um, dead, died, buried, resurrected on the third day, ascends into the heaven, and sits down at the right hand of the Father. He sits on a throne at the right hand of the Father. And this is referring to, 1 Corinthians is referring to Psalm 110, verse 1. Um, For the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool. It was prophesied that Jesus would ascend into heaven. He would sit on a throne at the right hand of the Father. And, and Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, he is to sit on that throne until he has dominated the whole earth, till all the enemies have been made his footstool, until his gospel has covered the whole earth. Jesus sits on the throne and working through the power of his church here on earth, he spreads his gospel until his gospel covers the entire earth. And that moment when that last unbeliever converts, that moment when the world has been evangelized, that is when he returns with that blast of the trumpet. And that blast of the trumpet is to declare his success. The, the king has finished it all, and here he comes. Here he comes to, to dominate, uh, to express his dominion over this world. The second coming comes after Jesus has subdued the earth with the gospel. And, and note there, remember in the life of Jesus, when he was tempted by Satan, remember the temptation from Satan is, worship me and I will give all of these nations to you. Worship me, I'll give all these nations to you. Jesus says no, not because he doesn't want all the nations, but because he doesn't want them from Satan's hand, right? He, do, he doesn't want to take them from Satan, worshiping Satan. He's been commanded by the Father to sit down on the throne and extend this dominion through the gospel. And that, that temptation from Satan was Satan's attempt to short circuit the cross and to, um, and to remove the power of the gospel so that Jesus couldn't conquer the nations himself, right? But Jesus says no. He sits down at the right hand of the Father, and he's there until this world has been Christianized. And then that trumpet sounds, and that's when the king comes. That's when the king comes back to this earth. The second coming, then, is the triumphal parade of the conquering king through the land that he has just subdued. So what should our present disposition regarding this future second coming look like? What, what is our present disposition regarding this future second coming? The answer is that we are supposed to be presently loving this future moment. There, it, it should have a place in our heart where we love it. This is 2 Timothy 4.8. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. All right? uh, Paul sees a crown that is waiting for him, and he says, and, and, it, and it's waiting for everybody here who loves his appearing, who looks forward to that moment, that trumpet blast, with, with deep affection and desire. I want to see that. I look forward to experiencing that. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O Lord, come. O Lord, come. That, that, Last phrase there, oh Lord, come. If you're um, a biblical language geek, that part gets kind of exciting because in the Greek, it's not in Greek. Um, the whole text, you know, it's all Greek, but this is one of the very few places where you'll see an Aramaic phrase show up in the Greek New Testament. So everything is Greek up to here. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. And then it's, it changes to this Aramaic. And the Aramaic there is Maranatha. Maranatha. You probably heard that expression, Maranatha. And Maranatha is Aramaic for, O Lord, come. Um, and Aramaic is the, it's the native tongue. Greek is the scholar's tongue. It's the, it's the, it's the language you have to write in if you're going to send this, this, um, this epistle around. 
But, but Aramaic is the, is the tongue you grew up with. It's the, it's the native tongue. And it's this sort of primal prayer, which is just simply, O oh Lord, come. Excuse me. <clears throat> Oh Lord, come. We, this desire to see Jesus Christ come back. And, it, and, it, and it's expressed in this most sort of primal way of Maranatha. Um, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you long for and love his appearing. That Maranatha is the, the cry of your heart as you look for the coming of Jesus. And we love the appearing of Jesus Christ because when, when he comes, Paul says this. He says, um, when he's describing the second coming, 1 Thessalonians 4.18, he says this, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. He's describing the second coming, and he says, Comfort one another with these words. The, the, we're supposed to look forward to the second coming because this doctrine is supposed to be a great comfort. Um, this is why I think that the, the dispensational, secret rapture, pre mill stuff does such a disservice to this because of the way it turns it into this dreaded ghost story. This, this boogeyman, this scary, terrifying thing that makes it hard for you to sleep at night. You're nervous, you're scared. What about the beast with the Antichrist? All this. That's, that's just so not what this is supposed to do for us. This, the doctrine of the second coming, Paul says, you know, you're, you're uneasy, you're nervous, you're unsettled about all things, but remember Jesus is coming. There's, there's a second coming. There's Maranatha. <clears throat> and so that is a, and he intends it as a comfort. Like it makes everything go, everything in your heart settles and you have a peace in your heart when you realize Jesus is coming and he's going to put all things right. John 14, Jesus has these words for us in verses 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believed in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I'm coming again. And he says, therefore, let not your hearts be troubled. Your hearts should, should drop all their anxieties, all their, all their cares, all their worries. Let not your hearts be troubled because Jesus is coming again. It's supposed to comfort us. So we love the, we love the Lord's appearing because it comforts us. And then the, uh, the second thing um, is we love the appearance of Jesus Christ in the second coming because when he appears in the second coming, that will be your first real, true glimpse of glory. Um, it, it, it's, it's this amazing thing. It's really interesting when you, when you read through all the verses that describe the appearance of Jesus Christ in the second coming, almost all of them will have the word glory somewhere in there. Titus uh, 2 verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Glory always shows up in there. Um, when Jesus comes in the second coming is the first time we're going to actually see him in his glory. We've not, we've not seen him before. The disciples didn't see him in his glory other than on the Mount of Transfiguration. But most of us, um, even those that knew Jesus, never saw true glory. And glory is one of those words that like, we use it, but I don't, know that we, we, I don't know that we know what we intend by it. We have a lot of metaphors that we use to kind of help us to grasp what it might be like. Um, you, you know in the Hebrew that the word for glory is weightiness. It's heaviness. It's this, it's this really weighty thing. But then also every time, whenever you see glory, it's always described as this shiny thing. It's this bright shine. So it's, a, 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 it's like a heavy, weighty light that is a piercing light. Um, but, but those are all just like really haphazard attempts to, to conceive of what glory might be via these different metaphors. What is glory itself? I don't think we have any idea. I think we have just this vague glimmer of an idea of what glory is. But when Jesus Christ appears in that second coming, <clears throat> that will be the first time that you will actually glimpse glory. That will be that first ray coming up as the, as the sun rises where we will actually see the glory of Jesus Christ. And it gets better than that. Philippians 3 verses 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, for from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. The glory that is revealed in the second coming of Jesus Christ, he says here, um, 
The Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. That glory is a glory that you will see from the inside, right? Because you'll you'll see the glory of Jesus is the glory of his resurrected body, but the moment that you see him will be you in the resurrection, meaning you will be resurrected, you'll be conformed to his likeness at this moment. So the glory that you're going to see is a glory that you're actually going to see from the inside. I'm not even, I have no idea what that's like. Um, But but it's, it's this incredible moment where we'll know glory and we'll not know glory because we see it from afar, we'll know glory because we see it from inside. We'll be inside of glory. So um, at the second coming, we'll not just be witnesses to the glory of Jesus Christ. We will be partakers, we will be partakers of the glory of Jesus Christ. We will be experiencing this glory from inside of it. And this will be um, this, this notion that we'll experience glory from the inside. This is actually going to be really important in a couple of weeks when we talk about the final judgment. This has real implications for the final judgment, but I'm going to save unpacking this un- until then. Um, for now, it's a, it suffices to say that the second coming will be our first glimpse of Jesus in his true glory and our first real taste in our lives of what glory is. So to conclude, we presently love the appearing of Jesus Christ. We look forward to it with eager expectation of the glory that we will then glimpse. And we comfort ourselves now in all our trials with the comfort of this promise. Jesus is coming again, and Maranatha ought to be our constant prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, our souls wait for you, and we hope in your word. Like the watchman waiting for morning, we long for your appearing. Lord, we look forward to the day when our faith turns to sight when our hope turns to pure love, that day when we see you in glory. With your people from all ages, we pray, Maranatha, and we comfort ourselves with your promise that we will see your son come again. So we pray now as your son taught us to pray, saying, God is and always has been jealous for his sacramental signs. In ancient Israel, he rebuked them for misusing the sacrifices and offerings. His jealousy flared when his people treated such ordinances as ways to buy God off. The vain heart thinks that offering a pure lamb upon the temple altar would put God at arm's length. God is angry with sin. Quick, let's make some sacrifices in order to chase off our God whom we've angered. These sacrifices, when misread, became a greater damnation upon God's people. He tells them by the prophets that he never desired rivers of blood. The burnt offerings were meant to be the means of assuring Israel that God had drawn close to them, not the way to get him off their case. The pagans viewed sacrifices as ways to appease vindictive gods. They didn't want the gods to come down from their celestial mountains, for then only mischief and heartache would be left in their capricious wake. But Israel's God gave these sacrifices for quite an opposite purpose. He gave them as a covenant feast to be enjoyed between a benevolent and merciful king and his beloved and loyal people. We must not fall into a similar trap. This is a meal, a feast, a supper inaugurated by Christ in the warmth of an upper room with his inner circle. This isn't a way to try to keep God happy with you. For if you are in Christ... God truly does rejoice over you. God spreads his banner of love over his elect people. And this is why you must come to this table in certain faith. Draw near. Pull up a seat. Put your elbows on the table. This isn't fast food. This is a feast. This isn't a visit to the principal's office. This is a feast where God speaks to you the steadfast word. And that word is Christ given for you. And so come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our God and Father, by this bread and wine, you assure us of your delight in drawing near to us in order that we might be brought into the joy of your triune fellowship and love. Your son shed his blood that we might be brought close and your spirit has given us new hearts to be satisfied with such good and precious promises. We give thanks now in Jesus' name and amen. The prayer of Maranatha is supposed to be a means of finding God's comfort. So the charge is this. Learn to pray Maranatha as a way to calm your soul and to claim claim God's comfort of the coming of Jesus Christ. Receive the benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, 
<coughs> who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And amen.